China has already begun to conduct military exercises to prepare for a potential invasion of Taiwan. It has been holding military exercises assessing China's amphibious sea lift capability and has typically focused on its Navy's dedicated amphibious assault ships. In recent months, all of us have heard the news about China preparing to invade Taiwan. People like the then commander of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, ADM, Philip Davidson, have warned us about China wanting to take military action against Taiwan in the next six to 10 years. On hearing this, some people believe that this was a sloppy exaggeration, while others took the warning more seriously. But both parties could agree we still had some time before China took this drastic measure, as we did with its best friend and most vital ally, Russia. But like with Russia and the invasion of its neighbor, the prospect of an invasion of Taiwan by the PLA could be closer than we expected. While researching this video, I found to what extent China has exploited its power over private corporations to fulfill its political ambitions. And if you find this video equally informative and interesting, please consider liking it and subscribing to our channel. It would mean a lot. But before we discuss the vital strategy, let's first look at what China has done recently. On September 18th, China flat out denied the existence of a median line in the volatile Taiwan Strait, sticking to its claims of Taiwan being part of China. Meanwhile, Taiwan detected a record 103 Chinese warplanes circling the island nation within 24 hours. Taiwanese Ministry of Defense further added that 40 out of the 103 PLA aircraft crossed the median line. Those 40 incursions were made by 10 Su-30 fighter jets, 12 J-10 fighter jets, 4 J-11 fighter jets, 10 J-16 fighter jets, 2 Y-20 aerial refueling aircraft, and 2 KJ-500 airborne early warning and control planes. The Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning responded by saying that Taiwan is part of China's territory, and that the U.S. and the West should mind their own business and not sell weapons to Taiwan. Interestingly enough, Mao never addressed the PLA aircraft's illegal entry into Taiwanese airspace. But these are what one sees on the surface, but few realize that something far more sinister is brewing. China is actively addressing their most significant shortfall for a successful invasion of Taiwan. Most of us know about China's strategy of military civil fusion, or MCF, which is CCP's national strategy to develop the People's Liberation Army, or the PLA, into a world-class military by 2049. But unlike other developed countries and their methods, the Chinese Communist Party has devised an innovative strategy to utilize civilian technologies to fulfill its political agenda. Now, it is not unheard of for corporations to collaborate with private companies to develop something for military applications. Still, China does something that involves a little more innovation and a lot of bending the rules. Instead of collaborating with companies to build what suits the military best, China chooses to develop a product whose primary purpose is to fulfill civilian duties, but be suitable for the military's tasks as soon as required. For example, on the 13th of April, 2023, a peculiar thing happened. A Chinese commercial vessel, Zhonghua Fu Xing, deviated from its usual route between Dalian and Yantai and was detected by the automatic identification system as 700 kilometers south near Taiwan, heading towards Fujian province, carrying PLA Marines and participating in a PLA amphibious assault exercise, launching and recovering amphibious vehicles at sea. But this is not a one-off incident. China has clarified that these ferries are integral to the nation's plans for a possible invasion of Taiwan, acting as a force multiplier in sea lift capability and generating tactical ambiguity by blurring the lines between commercial and military vessels. So far, the major chink in the People's Liberation Army's armor was its amphibious assault capacity because, on its own, the Chinese military does not have the amphibious assault capacity to invade Taiwan. Due to this, despite many worrying aspects of the degrading cross-Taiwan Strait military balance, people believed China invading Taiwan was unlikely. But China knows this and has been working behind the scenes since 2012 by integrating all major shipping companies into the Strategic Projection Support Ship Fleets. The fleet was split into three main theater commands, the Northern, Eastern, and Southern, responsible for the principal maritime theaters surrounding China including the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and the Yellow and Bohai Seas. These vessels are part of China's maritime militia fleet, like the fishing vessels involved in the South China Sea Disputed Islands standoffs. While fishing vessels excel in gray area operations, ferries exhibit superior sea lift capabilities. To aid the military, the PLA has started using roll-on roll-off ferries in its mission. They are the most efficient in terms of transport. First developed during World War II for the Dunkirk evacuation, 
These vessels are equipped with multiple access ramps, enabling quick embarkation and disembarkation of wheeled vehicles. Roll-on, roll-off ferries are used worldwide by militaries to deploy their troops. Still, they are purpose-built amphibious warships, such as the U.S. Navy's San Antonio class in most situations. Militaries use them since they can carry large numbers of vehicles. In this case, China's largest Roro ferry can hold up to 300 heavy-duty trailers, capable of disembarkation in hours, and cost approximately $29 million. In contrast, the San Antonio class costs $1.5 billion each, but has only a fourth of the carrying capacity of what the Chinese commercial vessels are capable of. However, the likelihood of survival for a commercial vessel in combat situations is low, since ships like the San Antonio class are equipped with defensive capabilities that make them more suited for contested sea space operations. But in the case of an invasion of Taiwan, the People's Liberation Army only needs a few hours to traverse the Taiwan Strait. In this scenario, two things take utmost precedence, the need for surprise and speed. For this task, a commercial vessel is well-suited with the added bonus of plausible deniability, like in the case of the balloon incident, while adding a veil of ambiguity around their use that can confuse or delay enemy responses. This is where China's military civil fusion policy kicks in. Some Chinese civilian ferries have been retrofitted with capabilities to deploy amphibious armored vehicles at sea, essentially making them auxiliary amphibious landing ships. In August 2020, the PLA conducted a cross-sea mobility evolution using RORO, roll-on, roll-off ferries. But for the first time, something unique was spotted. The ferry discharged military vehicles directly onto a beach using a modular floating pier. Commercial satellite imagery of a PLA amphibious exercise area in late summer 2021 revealed that the PLA may have developed an improved floating pier system to support amphibious operations. The offshore mobile debarkation system was featured in news coverage of a 2014 Guangzhou military region, GZMR, exercise. This was reportedly the first time the PLA used a civilian militia-operated Row Row ferry to embark and offload a PLA unit using the system. This exercise occurred in the southern port city of Zhangjiang, where an unidentified PLA mechanized infantry company was loaded onto the Nanfang 6, a commercial row row ferry that provides typical service between the mainland and Hainan Island. Interestingly, a semi submersible barge, often used in port construction projects, was placed at the end of the causeway to act as the pierhead. However, floating ramps are not enough to make embarking and disembarking possible. A vital component is ramps. First, the ramps must support the weight of the multiple armored vehicles and the weight to the very tip of the ramp. The standard ramp installed on a row row ferry cannot support such heavy loads, since it is usually an axial ramp linking the ship to the quay through a bow opening with a visor or side-hinged bow door, or internal ramps that are hinged on the inside. This works a lot like the doors of medieval castles. To overcome the weight problem, the PLA has been modifying row row ferries with new stern ramps, enabling in-water operations to launch and recover amphibious combat vehicles. These ramps structurally appear stronger and longer, and are actuated by heavier-duty hydraulic rams. Noticeably, the ramps are flanked by large, multi-hinged steel support arms that act as preventer stays to maintain ramp rigidity when under tension by the hydraulic rams and are mounted externally. However, some modified ramp systems will not be permanently installed, with the Marine Corps ramp being uninstalled as soon as the exercise is over. One area these Roro ferries are behind in is defensive capability. These ships are primarily used for civilian duties, so the need was never felt to install a defense system that would be necessary in the case of a war situation. But that could be easily rectified using China's vast fleet of Navy ships capable of handling wartime situations. But for the PLA, there are two strategic purposes. They act as a force multiplier, significantly augmenting the PLA's sea lift capability. Secondly, these commercial vessels generate tactical ambiguity, complicating the enemy's decision-making process. In the case of China invading Taiwan, the defending force will face the dilemma of potentially sinking a seemingly civilian-looking ship. China intends to utilize this ambiguity to their strategic advantage because it will result in a potentially delayed response. According to the law of armed conflict, there should be a clear distinction between civilian ships and warships, with the latter not being able to attack the civilian ships unless partaking in belligerently unlawful activities. China intends to utilize this ambiguity to their strategic advantage because it will result in a potentially delayed response. Plus, as mentioned before, commercial vessels act as a force multiplier. The addition of commercial vessels allows the PLA to increase their shipping capacity at a fraction of the cost, time, and resources needed to construct purpose-built amphibious warships. 
This increased capacity could prove critical in a rapid and large-scale operation, such as a possible invasion of Taiwan. To a certain extent, China has been taking notes from its most significant ally and its attempt at the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The biggest flaw in the case of Russia was the lack of logistical planning. At the start of the war, Russia believed the operation would last a few weeks at most and failed to prepare for a prolonged offensive. This lack of long-term planning proved a fault as the war dragged on. And China has no intention of letting small things like logistical planning get in the way of dictator Xi's long-term goals. Every CCP leader before Xi has expressed a desire to take over Taiwan as they see it as their territory. Xi has boxed himself into a corner. Since Xi came into power, things have taken a turn for the worse. And now, even the economy shows signs of slowing down. Despite Xi extending the term limit in the extreme surveillance state he has created, he must take over Taiwan to maintain power and his presidency. But two things are entirely out of his control. The first is the resistance the PLA will face once it gets to the Taiwanese shores. Like Russia, who underestimated what Ukraine was capable of, China could face the same fate if they are not careful and rely too much on the fact that they have a numbers advantage. Also, something that weighs on Xi's mind is the amount of support the US and the West in general are willing to support Taiwan. Making matters worse for the dictator, the US has taken an ambiguous stand on the actions they will take in case of an invasion. But needless to say, the support Taiwan could drum up may be far more significant than what Ukraine managed. All point to things not sailing smoothly for the PLA. Adding a layer of complexity would be the island's terrain, as it's made up of a heavily forested mountain ridge that runs down the length of the roughly oval-shaped island, which, from north to south, is 395 km, creating somewhat of a natural barrier. To the west of the mountain ridge lie fertile plains and large, sprawling cities. Taipei, the capital, is in the north, Taichung is in the center, and Kaohsiung to the south are spread out, forming a natural defensive barrier that would slow any advance by the Chinese People's Liberation Army, PLA, to a crawl. Soldiers would have to fight through dense, urban sprawls and blocks of apartments that can easily be turned into heavily defended strongpoints. Also, the whole western side of the island is crisscrossed with rivers and canals. Taiwan has few beaches suitable for amphibious landings and any force would immediately have to fight its way ashore. At the same time, deadly counterfire poured from the surrounding high buildings and cliffs overlooking the beaches. But still, all things point to China's willingness to invade Taiwan at any cost, despite the complexity of the task. But for now, some imperfections must be ironed out so China doesn't repeat Russia's mistakes. While the invasion may be a little further along, the ferry Zhonghua Fuxing incident demonstrates how China has blended commercial and military operations in its maritime strategy. This approach, including commercial Roro ferries, allows the PLA to increase their sea lift capabilities cost effectively, while creating tactical ambiguity that could complicate an enemy's decision making process. While this strategy comes with risks, namely the vulnerability of commercial vessels in combat scenarios, the PLA seems to deem these risks acceptable in specific contexts, such as a possible invasion of Taiwan. As such, the continued observation of China's maritime strategy, particularly its use of commercial vessels, is critical for understanding its broader military intentions and capabilities. I hope that you had as much fun watching it as I did making it. And if you did, please consider liking this video and leaving behind suggestions in the comments section below. And thank you for sticking up to the end of the video, and I hope to see you guys very soon.